kind of in between the things you want to go do. There's a belief in the next five years that as autonomous vehicles get really good at level five, level five means you get in your car, you close all the curtains, you put on a movie, you sit and, you know, eat popcorn and it just shows up where you need to go, that no longer are you doing the things you do now, which is this time in between places that you go, which will disrupt our economy. What does that mean? That means like United States at 30% of the real estate market in New York or Atlanta or Chicago or LA are parking spots. If autonomous cars are here, you don't need parking spots. People get dropped off, they keep going. The re there's futurists will tell you the real estate market in those big markets, New York's a bad example, people don't drive to work. But Chicago, San Francisco, you get the point that the market will drop in five to 10 years, so buy real estate. Second is if you have drive-through, if you're a McDonald's or Starbucks, 70% of your business is people in their car driving through and coming through. If this is true, you don't need that. If you're in an autonomous car that's electric, guess what? All those gas stations we see, the quick trips and the speedways and everything else, no longer relevant. I could go on and on and on. So what's the disruptor? Um, there's an idea that there's gonna be mobile leisure entertainment. So think about a movie studio, an office, um, a relaxation place, a yoga place that's all in a vehicle that takes you where you wanna go. There's a belief if you're a home builder, that the average home in the United States has one and a half car spots today. If you're in a world in 10 years that people don't buy cars, a car picks you up in the morning, drops you where you need to go, you don't actually need that extra garage or that space that we have today. So there's a huge disruption factor that's gonna come with um, automobiles. Smart homes, um, internet of things, all the things that we believe are really, really important in the future. This idea that sensors are gonna be in everywhere we are. So, and it's all gonna be driven by something called 5G. Who in the room's heard of 5G? Everybody, you guys are way ahead. So many people are like, what's that, 5G? So 5G, basically, I saw a demonstration this um, January at a consumer electronics show. So basically, to download a two-hour two, um, two movie through Wi-Fi, excuse me, not Wi-Fi, uh, on your mobile network today, well, it could take an hour, hour and a half on your mobile phone. Um, with 5G, it takes about four seconds to do it. It's so fast that when you push the button, if you push the wrong button, it comes up so fast you can't even see the difference. It's that fast in terms of lightning speed. 5G will underpin the economy for autonomous cars. Um, all those sensors in that picture there will all feed into 5G to give information so that you can know more about your life to be more productive. Artificial intelligent and predictive analytics. Artificial intelligence will take all that data that we get through 5G and through the sensors to help us make better decisions and hopefully make our lives more productive. And then how it impacts things like health and wellness is that, you know, most, how many people here have like the equivalent of a Fitbit or something on in, in here? And I got it. So, I mean, the sensors we're going to get in the future are going to be all data to help us live our lives. Now, I've met people who say, Man, I'm, they'll say, I'm 65 years old. I hope I'm gone when all this happens because it does not sound like a fun world. Um, but then there's others that say this is going to make our life a lot more productive. I'll give an example. I was at a retailer in Southern California a couple weeks ago. You walk in, you swab the inside of your mouth, you give them the swab. Uh, a minute and a half later, it spits out a shopping list of things to help you run faster, sleep better. You've got a big exam, how you can focus better. And as you shop the aisles, it gives you things based on your swab to help you make better decisions for your life. And then from our business, this Amazon, um, oh God, Amazon Whole Foods intersection has really disrupted, whether it be Kroger or the Publix. I mean, all the big retailers are wondering how is this all gonna play out in the future? Um, this model of building big, beautiful stores with big park parking lots might not be the model in the next five to 10 years. So that's a little bit of a peek unless we think about the future, and that's either good or bad, depending on your view. But let me give you a peek of the future now. This is Robbie, the self-driving delivery robot, and I'm gonna show you a short video of kind of what the world could look like. Robovan, partnership between Starship Technologies and Mercedes-Benz Vans creates the perfect synergy of transportation technologies for local delivery. With mature transportation efforts, robots and vans converge into one. The result is the most efficient, cost-effective and convenient delivery system in the world. The RoboVan is a first-in-the-world transportation system that comprises of self-driving delivery robots developed by Starship Technologies and Mercedes-Benz vans that act as a mothership and are configured to allow robots to enter and exit autonomously during delivery stops in the local neighbourhood. 
The Mothership concept is the combination of the intelligent and innovative van with the smart and agile robots of Starships. It will really be a quantum leap when it comes to lost my logistics. The specially adapted Mercedes-Benz vans stop in designated areas in the local neighborhood for loading and unloading of the local fleet of delivery robots. For delivery to be carried out as efficiently as possible, the best stop for the van is calculated based on the location and the status of all the robots within the area. The Robovan can hold eight Starship delivery robots and has multiple baskets above the robots for storing the goods for that particular area. The robots autonomously drive into the van for loading by the driver and once loaded, autonomously drive out the other side of the van for delivery to the customer. The loaded robots can thus be sent on their way as a free-floating robot fleet to deliver their cargo safely and reliably within a radius of up to two miles. In the future, the innovative cooperation between Starship Technologies and Mercedes-Benz vans will ensure quick, on-demand and cost-effective delivery for consumers. Great, thank you. Not a commercial for Starship or Mercedes, just as a piece that this is the world we're living in and that's actually being done in some parts of the world. So now I'm going to talk a little about beverages. Um, I lead a group called the Venturi and Emerging Brand Group for the Coca-Cola North American business. And what we're focused on is where the consumer is going to be in the next 10 years and trying to identify areas that the Coca-Cola company can participate in based on where consumers' needs are going to be in the future. So why did, why did we set up this group? I mean, the Coca-Cola company has been over 100 years, been very successful, a wonderful company of over 500 brands, does business in over 200 countries. But we know that to stay relevant and to stay, um, to stay ahead of the curve, we've got to do everything we're doing today, but also stay ahead of the future, which we talked about a second ago. Um, maybe brands you might have heard of. You've heard of brands like Vitamin Water, Muscle Milk, um, Five Hour, Five Hour Energy. What we learned in the last few years that most of the disruptive brands that have been launched actually have not come from big companies, you know, whether Coca-Cola or many other big companies. So how do we capture the trends that are happening with entrepreneurs out there? Also, we know that if one of us in this room launched a beverage, we have a 98% chance that we're going to go do another day job in two years. Like, it's not very easy to launch Scott's beverage in the United States. And then lastly, if we do launch it, it takes about eight years before it's profitable. So it's not, you know, one of these things when you do it that, um, that it's instantly a really big success. Um, so now, in the world that we live in, whether you're in food, beverage, athletic apparel, snacks, a couple things have happened. There's a blending of categories. So no longer is it like you're just a soft drink or you're a cereal, you know, that consumers are seeing blending. So like if you're in the cereal business, some of the cereals are in snacks. If you're a snack, sometimes you're a potato chip, sometimes you're a snack bar, sometimes you're a cereal. In the, in the business of beverages, it's the same thing, which brings a lot of complexity. I'm gonna talk about regulation a little bit later, but what you need to take away is all these small categories that, um, that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, uh, when you collectively add them up, they're growing at eight times the rate of the big categories. And whether you're in beverages or food or, you know, athletic apparel or jeans or whatever, it's the same trend you see out there. It's called the long tail. A couple things to take away. Um, there's over 7,000 beverage trademarks out there. 98% um, of them don't make it. And I always say 2.2% chance of being successful. And I was talking to a successful entrepreneur um, last week. Um, he launched a company called Body Armor with Kobe Bryant. He's doing very well. And I asked him, what do you tell a young person who wants to grow up and be like you? He's very, very successful and you know, has racehorses and all the things that people get when they have lots of money. And so um, and he said, I tell them never to do what I do. And I said, well, well, dude, you talk about you didn't have a college education. You've changed your family, your grandparents, everything. You've changed everything. He said, Scott. I want to tell them not to do it, and I hope they don't listen to me because it's not easy, because I hope they don't listen to me because there's going to be days when it's not going to work out, and if they're not committed to it, for me to give them my speech on being like me, it's not the way to do it. Uh, what did I just do? There we go. Great. So how do we do this? With this crazy world of all kinds of things happening, we focus on the consumer, we watch the marketplace. Um, we look at what retailers are doing because retailers have to make space for a lot of these new products and then science and regulatory and I'll talk more about that in a second. So I told you I, I lead a group called the Venturi Emerging Brain Group. We do four things. 
First, we have to have a line of sight to the future, so kind of where the consumer is going to be in the year 2028. Second, we invest and engage entrepreneurs or invest and engage opportunities within the Coca-Cola company we want to take outside the building. Next, once we engage those opportunities, kind of like, um, like an egg in an incubator, we try to figure out how do we surround it with the right resources to make it successful because with these small, small new ideas, you have to give it a little bit of magic to be successful but not so much just smother it. And then lastly, how do we bring the right level of integration that helps it be successful but not kill the idea? But me versus me telling you about it, I'm going to show you a short video of what we do. Once, the beverage market was simple. You could count categories on one hand. Today, it's a maelstrom of ever-evolving categories and consumer desires. It's exotic teas, handcrafted sodas, all-natural energy drinks, and chia-filled superfood kombucha. The number of beverage trademarks has doubled in the past 10 years, and the market is becoming crowded. But the truth is, most of them won't make it, and few will reach the billion-dollar mark. So how do we sift through it all to find the brands with the right idea to become our next billion-dollar beverage? Enter Venturing and Emerging Brands, or VEB. We explore, we invest, and we grow emerging brands to ensure the company has the right pipeline today to win tomorrow. Our first role is as cool hunters, market scrutinizers, and research-backed clairvoyants. We look to the future through distinct lenses of insight, consumer, market, retail, and government. We analyze macro and micro consumer trends with a focus on the highly engaged consumer group. These are the pioneers, the early adopters, those with influence and loud voices who are health conscious, care about ingredients and where they are sourced. Next, we look at the entrepreneurial activity in the emerging marketplace, which creates the supply. We know that when conditions are just right, when consumer trends and market activity collide, we find industry disruption. But we must remember, this disruption may diminish or scale depending on the retail landscape and the government research and policy, which often lag behind but provide great influence. In our second role, we invest and learn. Our partnerships allow us to use capital and talent to participate in these growing categories, as well as manage growth and risk. VEB's third role is about nurturing and growing. We provide expertise, insight, and strategy to help emerging brands win. For example, we have dedicated field marketing and sales teams to enable 360-degree high-touch brand building. We find just the right places for our products and target just the right type of consumer to get products into exactly the right hands. This specialized support takes patience, but uniquely positions our brands for sustained growth. Each of these roles plays out across a brand's road to success. In phase one, a brand's concept is tested and its proposition refined. In phase two, VEB proves out the concept of the brand, building confidence and momentum. In phase three, we steadily grow the brand's presence in market. And finally, at just the right moment, the brand graduates to an operating unit within the company, where it can leverage the strength of the Coca-Cola system. But even with all this rigor, we must remember that all will not succeed, like a seedling that is planted and must be properly nurtured. VEB provides the soft and high-quality touch so brands we nurture today and those we welcome to our family tomorrow may grow and reach their potential. Welcome to VEB. So I've, I've talked about the future trends, Robbie the Robot. I talked a little bit about how we think about trends within our venture and emerging brand group. I'm going to give you some real examples. So first, I, and this is just my own learning, so don't... How many people have heard of Fairlife Milk? Whoa! Really, you should, I mean, it's still in like only 7% of the household, so that's really good. Did you have your hands up? But the Coca-Cola company is in the dairy business. Who would go figure about that 10 years ago? Let me tell you why. Um, that gentleman up there is a venture farmer. And say, what's a venture farmer? Venture farmers are um, multi-generational, very successful people that own tens of thousands of acres of land that want to figure out how to make their farming more productive. And that gentleman, Mike McCluskey, has basically been in the business of dairy for many, many generations. Very, very smart. But he had an idea. He had an idea that if we deliver really good milk, best milk in the marketplace, packaged right, with great marketing, with a superior partner, that we can win in the marketplace. So this is like five or six years ago, and someone said, well, better milk. I mean, go figure. What are you talking about? 
He says, well, my cows, I um, make sure it's 68 degrees every day, no matter where they are, whether in Arizona or upstate Michigan, 68 degrees every day. Second, I play classical music all day long so they can be really happy with quiet, resting music. And this is a true story, everything I'm telling you. Quentin, am I right? Cla classical music. And lastly, they get to go get milked when they want. And our, our top leadership said, well, I don't believe all this stuff. And you went to the farm and you actually saw it. And what you find is that cows that are under less stress, their milk is better. What we found is the milk coming out of their life has lower bacteria than milk that's already been pasteurized. It's creamier, it's fluffier, it tastes great. It tastes great. If you haven't had it, you have to have it. Second, um, he's worked on unique technology. So he's taken this great milk that comes out of these classically trained um, cows, right? And he has a technology that takes the milk apart and boosts the protein, removes the lactose, and puts it back together, but adds nothing else to it, so it's still all natural, which we call filtration technology. Then he puts a really smart team of people, both from the Coca-Cola company and his team, focused on really cool packaging. Most time we've seen milk in the last 15 years, it's in a jug or a carton, it looks kind of just bland. Um, that packaging has been very, very exciting, consumers love. And then with a really good sustainability story, great taste and great marketing, We've built a business that's, um, that many would say it's going to be a billion dollar business one day. Very, very exciting. So one of the many ventures that we've entered that we're excited about. I'm just giving a couple examples. The next one is um, this gentleman at the top, this idea that he believes. So he's, um, he's a Yale um, graduate school, um, graduate, alumni of Yale graduate school. But I'll tell you his quick story is that um, to tell you why he's different. He wrote his last paper on um, conscious capitalism. So when he was going to graduate school, he was going to work for a venture capital company that only invested in companies that had social responsibility that turned all their profits back to more challenged parts of the world. Um, versus when you read about a lot of venture capital, it's all about their own profits. But his belief was, could I develop a beverage that's um, good on health and wellness, that has a sustainability, so everything goes back to the people who actually helped make the beverage, and has a societal impact. And that beverage in his paper that he wrote at Yale was called Honest Tea. That gentleman's name is Seth Goldman. Um, he's built a wonderful brand that we bought, and he's still a part of the Coca-Cola family 15 years ago. And today is now in teas, kids' drinks, a soft drink, a sports drink, and AIDS. Have many people heard of Honest Tea before? Maybe you've seen it before? I love that. That's great. But another wonderful brand that's on trend. And the Honesty Index was a really clever um, kind of marketing judo. So typically in the world of um, consumer goods, like the person with the biggest budget kind of wins the war because they get to hire the biggest celebrity and, and spend the most money at the Super Bowl. Well, these little brands don't have those kind of marketing budgets. So he cleverly um, thought of, well, look, you know, we're all about honesty. So we're going to take you know, 50 cases of Honesty and put it in front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and put an honor box that says, take one, but can you please put a dollar in for every bottle in the box, and, um, and we'll give that to charity. But there was just a camera there, and there's no people there. And what you saw the first year is that people kind of walk up, and you know, I grew up in suburban Washington, D.C., I spent a lot of time in D.C., and you know, I'm kind of a suburban city person, but if I walked up and saw, and I was 17, and I saw like all these beverages there with nobody there, and I could leave a dollar, I might not leave a dollar. If I don't have a dollar, I might not leave a dollar. So my point is, uh, what he did was he found out in Washington that 87% of people were honest, but there were still a lot of people, both in suits and not, that would take a beverage and leave. But then local news picked up on it and started covering the story. And they're like, how honest is DC? So next year, week was Wall Street. Next was Vegas. Next was LA. Next was London, and it became kind of this viral marketing campaign that didn't cost a lot of money, but everybody wanted to cover. So really cool idea built on health and wellness and sustainability, really clever marketing with a really good brand story. One of many examples. The next one is this idea of coconuts. Who's had coconut water? All right, now, who likes coconut water? Hands, less hands are up. All right. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I actually like coconut water. It's salty. And, and the thing about it, what's funny about coconut water is that um, the first time I had it, I was like in kind of a meeting room with food. They're like, we're going to go invest in a coconut water company. Try it. And I, I drank a little bit, so I could not drink this. But um, the, the next time I had it, I was in New York in July, like dressed like this, walking the streets of New York with our bottler. And it was 98 degrees, and I had a coconut water, and I downed like four of them. And so it's all about the right point of sweat to have that. I see some smiles there. But let me tell you about this. This gentleman, Mark Rampola, believed that um, 
that there are many different sports drinks and hydration drinks out there, but nature already makes a great one, and it comes from coconuts, that when you drink it, it has electrolytes, it hydrates really fast. There's a belief in a lot of, hit, there's a lot of folklore that in some of the, um, the wars in Latin America, that when people um, didn't have IVs, I, you know, I never, I, I've said that, if I wasn't here, I would say this story, and, and people, if it was, they believe me, but I need to couch it, I'm not sure if it's a fact, but I've said it a few times, is that um, if there's not an IV, supposedly they were able to get a coconut and stick a cord in it and put it right into someone's vein. I have no idea if that's actually true, but we said it many times in Zico, but supposedly coconut water is a great natural rehydration beverage, and it's one that um, it's very much on trend, especially people who are ultra athletes, people like yourself in this room that sometimes are doing high physical activity, they want something that's naturally um, occurring like coconut water. Again, we invested in the brand about eight years ago. We bought the company about three or four years ago. It's over $100 million today. It's on a really great growth track. The idea was, could you have coconut water that comes from nature, um, have a couple different flavors of chocolate, a pineapple that have lightly, have some hint of other things in it, and then market it with really cool people like these folks from the Olympics or Jennifer, Jessica, Jessica Alba, um, it might make it more approachable to consumers. So these are just some of the examples of categories we've invested in we think are hot for tomorrow. Oh, I've got one more. I, I didn't realize that. I, I, the screen is so big, I'm looking up at it. It's awesome. Um, the next, this is actually a more recent investment we made about two and a half years ago. Um, who's ever heard of, I don't think many hands are good, who's ever heard of Suja cold press juice? No one. Oh, wow. So we got work to do on that one. So the idea here was that that people are paying somewhere between eight and eleven dollars for um, juiced beverages. They come out of the gym, the yoga studio, the run, or at home they put in their Vitamix and they they're making their own juice beverage. And so this entrepreneur had the idea that if I could find a way to do that and put in a four or five dollar bottle that had been in the ground seventy two hours earlier, um, lightly processed or really not processed without heat, and put in the bottle that people will pay anywhere from four to seven dollars depending on the package. The idea is called Suja. It's based in Southern California. It's over, it's like a 250 million dollar company. And what they do is that they use something called HPP processing. So I'm getting really geeky here. And what that is, is that um, um, you take all the cold pressed juices and fruits and vegetables put in a bottle and you drop it to 50,000 phantoms in kind of this drum. And what it does is it reseeds the bacteria but you never put the heat on it. The good news is that when you taste it, it tastes like you know watermelon or peach or apples that you just crushed in your home, but it was in the ground three or four days ago. And people are willing to pay a premium for it, and that's very much on trend. He has a lot of beverages, and that big machine is actually the um, HPP machine that, talk, that does what I just talked about, that takes it down to 50,000 um, uh, levels. So these are just four of the 40 investments that we made, all future looking, all small today, but we think are big tomorrow. I'm going to transition to where I think the world's going to be in beverages. Well, before I do that, I'll tell you a little bit more. So we've looked at over 4,000 brands. So we've, we're like the Shark Tank. So we've got people calling every week. I think I was driving down here, and there was a company that um, that is um, is it, it's developed a beverage based on the diet of a chimpanzee. Now, now when I tell you these stories, it doesn't mean that I love these ideas. I'm just telling you an example of an idea. Um, and the entrepreneur said that he studied chimpanzees, they live to 90 years old, they typically are fit as a fiddle till they're 90. And they do it through eating seeds and berries and the peel of the banana. So he's developed a beverage that does everything chimpanzees do and put it in a bottle and he hopes to sell it to the US consumer in a big idea. I have no idea if that's gonna be a big idea, but we look at 4,000 of those brands and make a decision if we're gonna make a bet on it. We've got 46 of those 4,000 that we actually do something with. Um, this collective work that we do, it's adding double-digit growth to our North American business, and it's worth billions of dollars today. So we're really excited about this work that we're doing. Um, and these are the examples. I talked about Honesty, Zico, Fairlife. We've got a brand called Hubert's Lemonade. Anybody ever seen Hubert's out there? A few hands. It's a um, Southern California-based um, company. Suja I talked about, and one of the most recent investments we made about a, nine months ago, it's a brand called Topo Chico. Anybody heard of Topo Chico? Got it, great. 
Um, there's a drink called the Mexican Rainwater, which you should never have, but it's an amazing drink. It's Topo Chico with bourbon, and it's a, one of the number one drinks outside of um, when you don't drink it with um, flat like that. But it's a mineral water that comes from a mountain in Monterey, Mexico, that's called um, Topo Chico, which is called Little Mole. It's a mountain there. And then top secret means we got more stuff coming in the future. <laughs> so what's next? The attack of the ants. What keeps me up at night is that the research shows that 50% of the growth in categories that we're in are going to be disrupted by brands and companies we don't know about today. And I could be at Nike, I could be at Coca-Cola, I could be at IBM, you name it, that this is what every senior leader is thinking about in American business, that your next competitor is not the one you know, it's the one that you don't know. So here's some examples. First, um, there's three big trends that we're seeing out there. One is process is everything, kind of how things are made. If you go out to a restaurant or a bar or things now, it's talked about handcrafted or cra it's a craft beer from this location or it's farm to table from the farm down the street. So I'm gonna talk more about that, but kind of how things are made are really, really important. And that's an important trend because 30 years ago, the US business across everything was made where we kind of didn't care where it was made. As long as it was made somewhere and it was inexpensive and it showed up in my home, we're happy. Today, consumers want to know where it's made. Um, enhance more water, more premium. Um, the idea of sparkling water, water with fruit, water with bubbles, um, water with functional ingredients. Have anybody heard of fat water? Fat water is another one. It's water with butter fat in it. People are like, I know, I was like, what? People are like, want water with different functionalities are a really hot trend. And then global flavors, this idea that kids 20 years ago was about ketchup, ketchup and today it's about sriracha and all these other exotic flavors that kids are having. You go to Chick-fil-A and they've got flavors that have come from around the world. So I'll talk more about that. Um, Plant-based. How many people have heard of adaptogens? Okay, now I'm starting to feel good. I feel like you don't know everything good. So, um, and that's, yeah, so but it also means that it's small. So adaptogens are a really big trend. Adaptogens are basically, there are 14 ingredients out there that, um, that have been around over a thousand years. They're typically based on Eastern Chinese medicine. So things like ginseng, matcha, um, ashwagandha, um, cat's claw, I could go on and on and on. They're all plant-based. That basically when you ingest them, whether it's in a food and beverage product, um, for me it might make me sleepy, for someone else it might give them more focus, um, but people are using adaptogens in their food and beverage products to get more out of their life. And this is one example. Um, this brand, we don't have an investment, it's called Rebel. I've met the founder, and Rebel stands for roots, extracts, berries, barks, and leaves. So it um, does not sound very appetizing, but um, he believes by li living a diet that none of the food ever is heated, it's all naturally and raw, that, um, that he's gonna live to 150 years old. So, and I do meet people that are focused on living to 150 years old. So um, anyway, that's one example. Next is um, the fourth wave of coffee. So the first wave of coffee was, predates you guys, things called Maxwell House and Folgers. The second um, wave of coffee was Starbucks. Starbucks really you know, kind of led the way of that you kind of had coffee at home or you could go somewhere else and kind of chill and have a latte and all these things that they served. The third wave of coffee was this cold brew coffee that came out the last five to seven years. The idea that coffee is cold to some people is bizarre. The fourth wave is coffee with benefits. So fat coffee, butter coffee, I've had lemonade coffee. There's a whole movement of coffee out there that people are lining up for. That um, it's a carrier, there's a belief that I get the caffeine from the coffee, but then I get the fat that's in the coffee that helps me with my indigestion, um, appetite suppression, on and on and on. Food tech, there's a belief that, um, that you can develop wines, beer, and food products about the animal. I was a entrepreneur recently that spends his time looking at the grocery store to innovate the cow, um, the pig, and the chicken out of the store, but deliver the same great tasting products. Has anyone heard of a brand called Beyond Meat? A few hands there. Um, if you ever had their sausage product, um, you can't tell that it didn't come from an animal. It was actually built in a lab from pea protein. But there's a whole food tech movement on how to hack what's in the store now and do it without actually using traditional mechanism. Big trend. I talked about this. This is the Nitro Brew coffee and the fat coffee there. I talked about that a second ago. It's so good. 
You, some of you might have heard of Bulletproof Me. I see a few hands there. There's a whole Bulletproof movement that uses fat is good for you. And this is Ripple. This is, um, this is a brand focused on developing dairy-based products all using pea protein. Again, innovating the agricultural out of it. Next, um, two other trends. One is called CBD and one is called nootropics. Who's heard of CBD? So, 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 so I can be really clear, I heard Quentin laugh in there. Is that, um, so CBD is the non-psychoactive ingredient that's in a hemp plant. And, so, and sometimes it can, can be confused with um, um, its brethren there, um, the, the marijuana plant. And so um, that's a trend that, um, that's, that we're seeing globally. Um, and the nootropics I'll talk more about is this idea that so much of the performance that's been out there today has been the, from the neck down. Like, how do I run faster, jump higher, recover from whatever I'm doing? But very few people have innovated to say, how do you make my brain run faster? Like, run faster, better memory, think quicker, be more focused. And these are two trends. CBD provides things like sleep, relaxation, anti-stress, anxiety. There's, in places like California, New York, Colorado, and again, this is not the psychoactive, this is not the illegal ingredient. Actually, in Atlanta, I was at a store, I, I don't go to these places often, but I was at a store called Nuts and Berries last week, and um, it, actually, now you let me digress, I have to complete the play, because um, I'm actually a pretty normal person, but I, I did my um, little deal in the last couple of days. My wife stopped at a, a natural food store on the way home that I would never have gone to, and as we're walking in, there's signs all over it saying, we've got CBD oil, CBD beverages, CBD food, we're doing a CBD workshop, we're doing CBD yoga. And I took pictures for my team, but my point is, this is a trend that's pretty hot out there. We're not sure where it's going to go, but consumers believe there's a lot of health benefits coming from CBD. And then this idea of nootropics, um, give me more performance for the neck up. Um, give my memory, make me sharper. Um, through natural energy, so the next next level of energy drink, we think this is another hot trend. So, I believe we're just scratching the surface. We're focused on the future. We're trying to drive growth for our company and to keep us out in front. Hopefully, these trends are some things you've seen. Um, but I wanted to just give you a peek on how we're thinking about leadership in the beverage category. And that is it. Thank you very much for your patience and your time and attention. Sir, thank you for sharing your thoughts and uh, time with us today. We'll transition now to a uh, question and answer session, um, and I'll MC for you. And as MC, I get the privilege of asking the first question. Sure. So sure. what qualities do you look for in leaders that you select to partner with in new ventures? That's a really, really great question. Um, basically this, um, I, you know, I probably every month see anywhere from you know, three to five um, new ventures. And, um, and because a lot of my team sees a lot that I don't see. And what I like to say is that um, I like to tell entrepreneurs, what do we talk about when you leave the room? Like you just made your pitch, your team's here, you've been working on it for weeks. You want the Coca-Cola company to invest in you. And what I talk about is really two big parts. One is the business proposition, and two is the individual. And we've had many business propositions that were right. They're gonna create great value, their consumer on, but they, we weren't the right partner. And when we think about leadership of the partner, we think about that. What I've witnessed in four years sitting in this job is very few plans or um, missions or plans that we put together. There's always this honeymoon when you, when, you, when you partner with an entrepreneur or anyone. We write a great plan, we love it, we love each other, we're excited. But what I've never seen one of them happen is to go exactly as planned. And so what I think about is kind of what's gonna happen the first hiccup. And every one of those positive examples, there were lots of hiccups. The road to here is like this, and if you don't have the right partner with the right common leadership values, we won't get to here. And, um, and, and I've said that to entrepreneurs because what's important to us at the Coca-Cola company, what we find is when we get to a business problem, when we get to a situation where things aren't where they are, we talk about what are we gonna do to fix it. We don't spend time doing this. And we find that's not productive. And I'm not pointing fingers, but we do have, there are a lot of, there's um, sometimes people are so self-focused on what they want out of the situation that they can't help themselves. And so we spend a lot of time, even after we figure out this is the right business opportunity to make sure that the person has common leadership values of a long view. So it's not about winning today, it's about winning together in the long term. It's about also how we treat our people 
It's about um, transparency and communication. It's about, um, we think about when we solve problems. I mean, I've been in so many executive meetings where we're talking about solving a problem, and they say, well, I got it, that works for us, but how are they gonna feel? Like, is this gonna work for them? Um, most recently, I worked on an opportunity where, in the end, we didn't go forward because we knew that we could win out of the situation, but all of our partners would not, and that's just not how we do business. And so, I don't know if that gets at it, but those are the things that I take away. But number one is I'd say, probably in your world, I assume the same, it's kind of very few um, missions or plans can be very well out. They don't typically always go as planned, and then kind of what happens during that time period. Can you pivot? Sir, thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll open up to the crowd here. Uh, any questions? Go ahead, right here up front. Uh, Lieutenant Anderson, sir. Um, given that you had mentioned that there's such a saturated market, not only in beverages, but in general with consumer and retail, what do you see as the challenges for a lot of these brands that may not necessarily want to scale to the billion dollar side? Some of them feel, you know, they don't necessarily want to be part of the Coca-Cola family, but they could use your resources. How do you see that trend in the long term? That's a great question. His question was that um, with such a challenging market of retailers, um, beverage companies, all trying to make it, some might not want to be billion dollars, but also it's very crowded. So how do they, and they might want to stay small and medium size. Um, it's really tough. Like for instance, I've studied like um, the craft beer market and we're not in, in this space, but I've studied it from just to learn from it. And you actually can be a craft beer company like in Columbus, you know, metropolitan area. And you can do pretty well if it's you and a partner and it's a brand that everybody loves. And there's enough, um, there's enough profit in a per case on a beer business to do that. Also, the way the market's set up, you can be very regional to restaurants and everything. The funny thing about the U.S. market is that um, it's very difficult to be small because when you think about the retailers we all visit, whether it be a Target, a Kroger, a Publix, or a Walmart, um, they really not necessarily want to do business in like one specific area. They want a solution once it's a good solution that can actually be broadly, not necessarily scaled, but brought, taken a lot of places. So what we find with entrepreneurs is that if you want to stay kind of less than 25 to $50 million, you can do that. But once you get to about $50 million in sales, you have to find a partner because suddenly you're now in all the Southeast and you're dealing with customers that are doing, doing business in a broader geography. And if you're a small group that can't talk for the whole half the United States or all the U.S., it's a problem for the customer and sometimes a challenge for you to stay in business. It's a great question. I saw one here, one there, yes. Sir, Lieutenant Ludwig, uh, considering all the products and ventures that you have overseen uh, or been associated with, which would you say you are most proud of and why? Wow, that's a great question. You know, sometimes I get asked that with my own team and you know, they're all from different groups. Because most, it's interesting about our, our, our group is that um, we're a couple hundred people, but there's about 14 people that are, came up through Coca-Cola. The rest are people that came from the companies we bought. So uh, if you go to Zico, um, you know, most of the people were yoga, volleyball, surfers, runners. You go to Honest Tea, most were people focused on um, societal, like, um, you know, the recycling things and um, societal impact. You go to Fairlife, it's all dairy farmers and they were, you know, I, I never forget jokingly, Quentin, our previous boss, asked for an early morning conference call, and he said, do you want to do it at 4 a.m. or 4.30? And we're like, time out. Um, you know, early, 7 a.m. would be good, but their farmers are up early. So my point is, um, when they ask which one's your favorite, it's very personal to them. Um, I love them all. I love them all. Um, but um, do I have a favorite? You know, I don't know about a favorite, but I think Fairlife's really cool. I think the dairy story is really cool. I, I have to admit, I almost fainted when they took me to watch um, the, the birthing of a cow. Uh, I think it's called a calf, I'm sorry. And as a, as a city person, um, I, that was a bridge too far for me. But, um, um, but, but I, I, I love them all, but Fairlife's an amazing venture. So. Yes. Mission um, or uh, any any particular thing that made you the size that you are today. Great. Um, he asked the question: What would be most? What are some of the most important things we've learned um, at VEB? Whether it be um, your mission, your strategy, your values, and kind of I want to say all of them, and that's probably that's that's too easy. 
Um, I'd say, you know, at first, we're small relative to the whole Coca-Cola company, to be really clear. Um, we're important, but, you know, there's, there's many big groups that run our North American business. But to answer the question is, when you, when you do a group like ours, and it's interesting, I shared some stories. We were here in, about two months ago for a leadership development where someone was talking to us coming from um, Fort Benning and talking about leadership. And what I took away, I talked about several initiatives that the U.S. Army's taken on to get something going that they, they weren't doing well. And I, I don't remember the exact initiatives, but they had to put resources against it to go make it happen. And um, that's kind of what we're challenged with doing in a big company. So whether it's our group or the ones that all the other companies have, the challenge is there's a lot of energy to want to invest in what you already know to be successful. And it's, there's not always a lot of energy to do all these things that these Robbie the Robots, you know, well, I don't know. I mean, you, I mean, you could just see it's just not normal. And so what's really key is having a really tight mission and strategy, like being clear on what you want to go do. Because wh why that's important is you can try to do everything and then you can't measure it, so, which gets to my next point, is that once you figure out what you want to go do and make sure that's really clear to your leadership, how do you measure it? And you got to make sure the measures are realistic. And, um, you know, a lot of my entrepreneurs will come in, you know, they're like, we're going to triple the business next year. And, and you kind of ask them why. And they're like, because I just believe. Well, that worked kind of in their world. But in my world where my company looks at a lot of different investment opportunities, I kind of have to give some precision to, okay, that's the mission, kind of what does success look like so that once I do it, I can say it was successful or not. And then lastly, mission, I mean, your values, is that um, you're putting people on our team that have the right balance of risk. Um, I've had people I've interviewed that would say to me that, um, well, Scott, like, how do you know you guys are going to be here next year? And I knew right then in an interview they're not the right person for this job because I don't know, right? I've got to prove every year that the work that we're doing is valuable. Um, the flip side, I've had people join the team that we're a venture group. We can kind of do anything we want. And it's like we don't, we're not held accountable. That's not good either. So you kind of have to have people that have the right mission and values. I talk about that. We show up at people's, these entrepreneurs, um, I call it their homes, their offices. I mean, they've kind of put their house on the line, their families, everything. And being respectful of that, although we don't work for them, but kind of showing up in a nice rent -a car and they're staying five in a room and you're staying in a single on the beach, like that's not the kind of values I want because you've got to empathize, although you can't walk in their shoes because those are the people that we're trying to partner with. So... I think it's a great. That's a great question. Um, well, do I do I direct or I'll go here and then. You pick, sir. Okay, go right ahead, and we'll go there next. Sorry, Lieutenant Tukarski. When you're building your team at VEB, do you tend to hire people more with a specialized talent or like a wider, shallower skill set? That's an outstanding question. When you pick people for the team, do we pick for um, specialized skill set or more wider and shallower? and really wider and shallower. Because um, I, I, just yesterday I was in an HR me human resource meeting, and we have a really talented person on our team that um, is a specialist. And the challenge is the work going forward doesn't match what this person does, and we just don't have the luxury of creating more work for that person. And so um, having people that can adjust and pivot to the work and have a desire to. In this example, another thing I learned when I was at Fort Benning, I, I'll never forget the term that um, the, the captain said. He said, if someone doesn't have the skill, but they, they have energy to want to go do it, we'll, um, we'll co-sign for that. And I thought that was really cool. This person has the ability, but does, has chosen what they don't want to go do. And in my group, we just don't have enough. We, our work just pivots so much. So having people that have bandwidth, and I'd say half of it's bandwidth and half of it's energy. Because um, you know a lot of people you talked about on my team, they might show up being HR or finance or sales. But when they sit in the room, it's like five of us talking about this business opportunity that has a 98% failure rate, that we have no crystal ball. Everybody's opinion matters. And then once we say we're going to do it, are you all in to go make it happen? And so um, I think um, wider and shallower is the one we look for most. I'll go there and there. Um, sir, Lieutenant Lenahan, um, so I guess my initial question is, you said that you don't see all the opportunities that come across your desk. So I'm wondering, if, is there a standardized evaluation process that you employed for your subordinates to discover the next big, I guess, entrepreneur that Coca-Cola would partner with? And then if so, what is the, um, how much creative, I guess, decision-making does, does the entrepreneur retain 
after you've decided to partner them throughout the process of brand growth? That's a great question. Um, the first one was that um, since I don't see everything, um, like how do I ensure that we have some standardized process? And then second, once we make the bet, like how do we keep the special magic of an entrepreneur? So we have a very um, lean checklist. It's one page. It looks at um, founder. It looks at brand story. It looks at how's the brand built. It looks at is it on trend from a consumer standpoint? Like is it futuristic or today? And then lastly, do we believe it has a path to profitability? The first meeting, um, it's literally very qualitative. And the reason we did this sheet was because we found ourselves after the meeting that whoever had the highest um, ranking in the room that liked it, that was the deal we went to go do. And then we thought that was just not fair. That was like a beauty contest. So we said, let's all do our own quick evaluation. Let's organize our thoughts that way. So that's the way we do it. And the other piece is I just don't have the bandwidth. But I have to admit that half of this is um, quantitative and half of it's qualitative. You know, um, what's really cool about the Coca-Cola company um, is that you would think that we have this systematized, but it really is people dependent. I mean, you know, if you're a person that saw a brand and you believe in it and you're willing to put your body and your mind and your heart against it, you might not get investment, but you'll get it through the ranks that it gets to the right meeting. By the same token, you know, some of my people, if they bump into it, they're like, I just don't think it's a good idea. It might not make it to the table. We just have to spread the kind of decision rights because we just don't, none of us can do it all on our own. But we do kind of have a, a cheat sheet to do that. Um, the second piece on entrepreneurial talent, another thing that's really amazing about the Coca-Cola company is that um, uh, uh, about seven or eight years ago, we did the, the, the acquisition of Honest Tea, which is the one that's a health and wellness social responsibility by Seth Goldman. Um, at the final table with our CEO of our company, um, he, this is the day he's finally selling the company to Coca-Cola, right? It's like he's been working on it for 12 years, it's a lot of money, blah, 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 and um, he just didn't seem like you would expect him to be happy, and it's all these bankers at the table, and our CEO asked him, Seth, what's wrong? And he said, well, this has been my baby for the last 12 to 15 years. I've gotten him every day with the idea that one day I'd be here, and now it's here, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and so I'm excited, but I'm like, I'm a little bit not excited. And he goes, well, what if you just stuck around? And you can imagine all these lawyers and bankers who this was not the plan before the lunch. Um, like, what are you talking about? This is the, he said, well, he said, what if you stuck around and continued to um, be the CEO of the company? Uh, we developed kind of an incentive program for you just for your business. You have your own stock and your own brand in the Coca-Cola company, and you make it all that it is. And so um, you know, when I tell people this story, still have an office in Bethesda, Maryland. He still is a part of our business. Um, he still brings innovation ideas. He has access all the way to the top of the house. And um, no, idea, no idea will not get unfunded if it's a really good idea. And people, and I can give you countless of examples that way, that we are a company that when you have like the right people you know, excited about it, willing to put their body on the line, I mean, they're really committed to it. I'd be hard pressed to not see people get their ideas done. And so for that really works well for an entrepreneur because they're so passionate about what they're doing that it works well in our culture. I think we had another one over here. It's certainly done rounds. Uh, traditionally, when I think of Coca-Cola, I don't really think of the healthy brands you kind of went through today. I think of you know, the nice glass of Coke on like a hot summer day. How do you and the other executives at Coca-Cola kind of manage that seismic shift? You talked about how the pace of growth changes from the traditional like, hey, soft drink with your Big Mac at McDonald's to, hey, we're Coca-Cola and we're gonna get you your coconut water or we're gonna get you your vitamin water. And like, how do you, how much do you hold on to the past versus how much do you do to the future? And you know, is that like a feel or is there a metric? Great question. Question was that how do we balance kind of today and the future? I'll say this, um, you know, what I show, it, it's really amazing work, but it's, it's probably 2% of um, all that Coke does. So Coca-Cola, and like our 500 brands still are the ones of the hearts and minds of consumers. What you find today is that, um, like I, it's funny, like the, the cold, press, cold press juice company, Suja, that was founded by a bunch of yogis and um, uh, uh, ultra marathoners. And, um, and I was doing an interview for them on Suja and he was drinking a Diet Coke. And, and we, we love Diet Coke, but we said, once you have a Suja, I said, well, every day at 12 o'clock, I just always grown up with Diet Coke, and he actually drinks his warm because when he's grown up, I guess they didn't have ice or ice box. I don't really know, but he only likes his warm. And um, my only point is that 
Our 500 brands play a role in consumers' lives, and what we found in today's environment is that brand Coca-Cola and kind of all the brands that we have today are still growing, are still a part of people's lives, but they also want additional choices that we want to round out that portfolio on. So I'd say this, um, you know, brand Coca-Cola to Sprite to Powerade to Dasani, all the way to coconut water all play a role in their lives, but it's a great question. The question was, um, how do I link my personal value system to the work that I do every day? You know, um, I, re I, I went to University of Chicago for graduate school, and I went up to speak a couple months ago, and someone said, wow, you, you have a really cool career. You had a perfect career plan. And I would tell you that um, I, I kind of didn't. I didn't really have a great career plan other than I knew that I wanted to do work that, um, that I was growing and learning, that I was working, someone, working for someone that I, I trusted and I could learn from. And then I was lastly having fun. Like when I went home at night, like I was really enjoying myself. And I said, if I didn't get two of those three things, like I probably should go do something else. And what I've been very fortunate at Coca-Cola is most time I've had two or three and sometimes all three. I've never just had one. And I have other people that work for me and the day I meet them, they come in and say, look, I want to be CEO of the Coca-Cola company. Like, here's my plan. And I'm like, wow, I didn't, never thought of that. But to get to your point, you have to know a little bit about my background. Um, my grandfather was an entrepreneur on the gas station, and my father was an entrepreneur on two convenience stores. And they were nothing like the entrepreneurs I meet that, that win big with these beverage companies. They made enough to take care of their family, um, put a couple kids to college, get one vacation a year. But when I grew up, I always said I wanted to own three gas stations and two convenience stores. It'd be like just a small town entrepreneur. Um, that's what I hope to do. And the reason I had that vision was that um, you know, my grandfather and my father, um, being African-American, they didn't believe that they could actually work for a company like Coca-Cola or IBM. They just didn't believe the opportunities were there. Um, then I you know, come out you know, 25 years later and I work for Coca a brand like Coca-Cola that enables me to be creative, um, that enables me to be passionate, allows me to work on things I really love doing. And it's, what's really amazing, and she asked the question, I'll tell you a funny story about five or six years ago. Um, we were looking at doing a beverage with another big sneaker athletic company that's not Nike, it was a big one. And, um, and we had this idea that, you know, could a, a sports drink partner with an athletic company with a cool athlete, we could, we could really make hay in the protein drink space. But then we had a brand at our company that thought they could do it themselves. And we're sitting with um, Quentin and my old boss, and we both make the pitch. And the pitch from the brand people were like, kind of, we might do this, but you know, we're only going to do this if you're going to do Scott's idea. And um, but when I made my pitch, he goes, "Would you, would you, um, if this doesn't work, would you, would you get fired or would you go home or you know, whatever the term is? Like you're done." And I'm like, "I believe in it that much." And he goes, "I'm going to fund that idea." And what that just taught me that that day, at least in this experience at Coca-Cola, is that. If you, we had some quantitative facts, we had qualitative facts, but the fact that we were gonna put our, kind of our, our body on the line, I like to say, and it was allowing us to kind of be creative and entrepreneurial all in that environment. And what I've witnessed in the last five or six years watching our senior leaders, which is amazing, and it's the same thing I assume in your senior leaders in the US military, is that so much of their world is not predicted. They've got all the history of what the past like generals or CEOs did, but so much of it, they're figuring out as they go. And when you figure it out as you go, it's kind of like you got what you've taught, you got what you know, and then it's instinct and courage. And what I watch for a lot of our senior leaders is that sitting in that room at seven o'clock, okay, what are we gonna do tomorrow? He's like, we're getting on a plane, we're gonna make this happen. And I, that to me just, um, that to me is what I love about what I'm able to do at Coca-Cola. It might happen in many other companies, I can only speak specifically for Coke, and that fits with my values, my passion, and why I don't feel like, um, like I have a gig, and I hope to never have a gig again. So that's, that's my two cents. <coughs> Sir, we've got time for one more question. Uh, this will be the final question. Let's see who gets it. Not one more? There's one. Okay, right here. Okay. Final question. Sir, uh, Lieutenant Juvenas, in your uh, presentation, you mentioned that technology is advancing uh, very rapidly, almost exponentially. Um, it's safe to assume that a lot of large corporations are going to have access to this technology. But what about the smaller businesses, ones that maybe wish to reach that one billion mark? 
can they do so in this environment and can they do it independently without relying on larger corporations? That's a great question. I will tell you today that um, the beverages of tomorrow, the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, will not build their brands like the ones, like some of the ones we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, frank, frankly, it's going to be a more meritocratic, democratic environment. We have, I've met entrepreneurs that have never been in a retail store that built $100 million businesses all online, and they're all people that are like tech geeks that, um, that are using you know, predictive analytics, um, data lakes to figure out where their consumers are and how they targeted them. And I'll tell you a funny story on it is that um, we have a, a business partner in New York that, um, that New York's a really unique market in the United States because a lot of the retailers are not like the big ones that we're used to, like in the suburbs that we're used to. So they're not chains and they don't have any data. And the way you get to them, and you know, they're like the hot dog stand, the newspaper stand at a little small store. Um, and many of them, the way you do business is, the guy says today, I don't have any way to pay you. And if you believe in the retailer, you spot them the beverages, you get your money in a week. It's a completely different game. This partner who does business has been doing this way for 40 years. And, you know, I, I, they probably at times, if you didn't pay them, I don't know what happens, but the net, is, it's a different game. So net effect is we had one of these tech company, beverage companies come visit them who'd never really been to New York and said, look, you know, we're a $100 million company. We're ready to launch in New York. And, um, and they brought in their people who were used to dealing with New York retail and said, the entrepreneur said, time out. Um, we don't need any of these men or women. And these guys have been doing 40 years ago. What are you talking about? He said, we already have a plan for New York. He said, well, you're, you're from San Francisco. What do you mean? He said, we know where all of our consumers are that buy our beverages. We know where they shop. We know the retailers they should be in. And we will give you the map. We don't actually need you to do anything but put them where we want and not put them where we don't want. And so they left the room, and these gentlemen have been in the business for a long time. Of course, they're just like, they're either, these people are either crazy or this is a new game. And so the CEO said, let's give it a shot for a week. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't believe this. So he did exactly what they said. He placed the beverages in the retailers that, um, that had been mapped through their digital analytics. And, um, and they've never seen a beverage brand uptick as fast as they've ever done. They've launched hundreds of beverages the last 40 years. And they've not put in the ones that they told them not to go to because they know that they, who their consumers are, where they live, and where they shop. So my only point is that um, digital technology is gonna change the game and the way you build brands, whether it's food, beverage, snacks, clothing, whatever. And, um, and that's the entrepreneurs of the future. What's really cool about that in the American way is that you don't have to have hundreds of millions of dollars to build your brand. It's one that if you have a great idea that consumers love, and you're creative in how you use the information, you have a chance to win, which I think is really exciting. And I wanna say thank you very much for your time. I'm honored to be here, and I was, um, when Quentin came to me and said that, um, that I had an opportunity to speak at this audience, I jumped at it because I was blown away by my experience two months ago when we were hosted from learning so much about what you all do every day. And I want to say thank you very much for your time. First, I want to thank you, Evan, again, thanks for sharing your time and thoughts with us. Uh, on behalf of the Maneuver Center of Excellence and the 199th Infantry Brigade, uh, please accept this small token of our appreciation for your time today. Thank you very much. Take a picture with it. There you go. <laughs>